with me today to Mark the 8th chapter. Mark chapter 8. I want to talk to you this morning. This is, uh, we've been on a series called Reference Point, And basically, we've got to get anchored in the Word of God. And that's, this is the fifth week on that. I, this may be the last one. Uh, we'll just kind of see uh, next week how the Lord is leading. But we've got to get anchored into the Word. You know, we go fishing up to Lake Erie. And I was thinking about this the other day. I've been on fishing and hunting a lot. I don't know what that's all about, but that's a good thing. But uh, we, we go to Lake Erie fishing, and uh, Mikey up there, the captain we always go with, uh, you know, he goes out there, and, and they, he'll, he'll, he'll go to a certain area, and, and, and he'll, he'll go and start looking at his, his GPS or his, his find. I don't know what that's called. It's a fish finder, but it's also a GPS that they use, you know. And then he, he finds where the fish is at, and he starts marking them. He starts marking where he's at on, the, on his GPS. That way, because what happens is when you fish up there, you need a little bit of a drift. Five, ten mile an hour wind. That way you, because when you throw, you, you kind of drift through that. Maybe a mile drift, two mile drift. They'll take you down through there. You know, guys, you know what I'm talking about. You guys have been up there before. And, and just drift on down through there. Well, if he don't mark where he's at, when it's time to go back to the place to find the fish, if he doesn't mark it on his GPS, he won't be able to find it. And it's exactly where we're going on today in America. We've drifted away from things and we don't know how to get back to the place where, 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 where truth is truth. We don't, we don't even, we call evil good, good evil. We've drifted now. We're trying to get back. We've got a whole generation of people that's truly waking up. I truly believe America is awakening. There is an awakening that's happening across the world, across this nation, especially believers awakening. It has nothing to do with political party. Now, I'm going to get in that in a minute. But the minute you start basing your life on whether who's in politics and who's going to be governing, you've you're got your eggs in the wrong basket. Now, you see what you're saying, Pastor Paul? Are you saying that you should? No, I believe you should vote. I believe there's a part. There's a, there's, there's, we have a part and a say and to be able to put people in positions. And I believe godly people should be in those positions. I agree with all that. But once you and I start looking to a political system to change the climate of a nation, wrong. Wrong. What's going to turn a nation back to God? It's not the Republicans. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Independents or the Libertarian. But what's going to turn back the, the, uh, the, the nation back to God is an awakening to God. And it starts right now in our hearts this morning in this church, in churches all across this nation. It starts in the hearts of the believers. Yeah, you ought to give the Lord a good hand of praise on that. It's the truth. All right? So we've been talking about this whole deal about getting back to a reference point, and we can't really can't go through all that again. It's been so good. You can look it up, and you can listen to it or get a CD, and it'll be good. It's free. But today I want to talk about attitude adjustment. Look at your neighbor and say, adjust your attitude. Now, you've been wanting to say that to your spouse for a long time. I just helped you. <laughs> I helped you out, man. You really wanted to be saying that, but you couldn't say it. Adjustment of your attitude. I want to start out with the scripture on the board as you were in Mark 8. But Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 in the Amplified. I want you to see this. We'll jump in the mix. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. Having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. A fresh mental and spiritual attitude. It's very important that you and I don't get our attitude polluted. I think about fresh, fresh food, fresh, fresh, something fresh means it's, it's, it's not, dilute, not diluted it's, or it's not polluted. It's not, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a brand spanking new. Are you with me here? Not spoiled. So don't have your attitude spoiled by the world. The world we live in is negative. And if you don't watch out, if you don't keep a fresh mental, spiritual attitude, and you don't keep yourself toned in spiritually, you'll find yourself giving in to the spirit of the world. You've got to keep yourself in a fresh spiritual and a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. What is an attitude? Well, an attitude, according to Webster's, is a settled way of thinking about something. It's a settled way of thinking about something. It's a point of view or a perspective. So attitude is a settled way of thinking about something. I want you to keep that in your mind as we go. It's a settled way of thinking. 
A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You have to get settled in what you believe. you got to get settled in this thing and say, Praise God, I'm a man of faith. I'm a woman of faith. I stand and decree and declare the word of God. I will not bend. I will not bow. I will not. Hallelujah. we got to have the same type of attitude that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. God will deliver, but if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. He's still God. Amen. So we got to keep a reference point. The enemy comes to try to steal your attitude. He wants to get you to have a bad attitude. He wants you to have a negative attitude. He wants you thinking contrary to the word of God. Amen. So in Mark chapter 8. I'm in Acts. That's not even close. Mark 8. Let's look right here in verse 11. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. And he sighed deeply. So he probably rolled his eyes too. Can you see this? You ever anybody do that to you? And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them, getting into the boat again, departing to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, is it because we have no bread? Now, this is kind of funny. you got Jesus. If you just read back here, he just fed 7,000 people. And before that, he fed 5,000. How many of you know that one loaf of bread with Jesus in a boat, it's no issue at all? And they're worried. Is he, crying to, is he coming down here to talk to us about this? We only had one loaf. We didn't, we didn't bring enough Happy Meals with us, boys. <laughs> and Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? <laughs> What's he saying? He said, Are you kidding me? I just fed 7,000 people. Do you not yet proceed nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said 12. Also, when I, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said seven. So he said to them, how is it do you not understand? So all of a sudden, we have religious folks, Christian people. We have church folk that shows up and starts questioning Jesus and says, Jesus, show us a sign. Now, hold on a second. I don't know about you, but he done ra he's raised people from the dead. He's, he's healed people. He's feeding people with just small amounts of food. And they're asking for a sign. Show us that you're the Messiah. Show us. That you're the Messiah. Show us Jesus. Call fire down from heaven. Split the sea of Galilee. Walk on the water right now and show us who you are. The religious leaders didn't know who he was. They knew so much about the word. But they, had, they, had, they were blinded. Their perspective was wrong. So Jesus takes a great opportunity and starts wanting to teach the boys about perspective. So he says, listen, boys, you need to make sure that you're aware and be aware of the leaven of Phar the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, this is real important. You need to get this, okay? He says, make sure because leaven is a type of thinking. It's an attitude. When we talk about leaven, it's something that's an influencer. It's a belief system. Uh, th there's three types of leaven that's mentioned in the New Testament. We have the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of, of, of Herod. We have the leaven of sin. We have the leaven of the kingdom. So... This is the deal. That's four, not three. Sorry, I messed up. Four. So Jesus starts wanting to talk to his disciples about their perspective. He said, listen guys, you can't let that type of, 
of attitude affect you. You can't let that type of stuff affect the way that you see things. The leaven of, of, of the Pharisees is a religious attitude. They put God in the center of it all, but he's a thousand miles away. The leaven of, of, of the Pharisees is, a, is people that come to church but have no personal encounter with God. Oh, let me help you. It's called practical atheism. It's practicing atheism. Oh, you never say that. But our attitude in the midst of the fire proves to us a lot of times what our perspective is. Because, see, leaven never rises without heat. Leaven never even accomplishes anything without some fire. See, it's in the middle of the fire that you and I are in in our lives that truly shows us our perspective. Amen. He said, beware of this religious attitude, a religious spirit, a religious perspective. It's, it's a form of godliness, but there's no power in it. They embrace God in theory, but in practice, they deny him. Oh, can I, get in, can I just help you? It's just amazing to me. I'm, listen, I believe in medical science. I believe in that. I believe in medicine. I, believe, I was a nurse for 15 years. You can never talk to me ever about that not being God. But good Lord, sickness starts knocking on the door and we don't even give God, we don't even bat an eye at it. We don't lay our hands on our kids. We don't lay our hands on our wives. We never speak the word. The first thing we do, we run off to the doctor. Now, I'm not against doctors. Please don't get me wrong here. But the deal is, is that we don't, I don't know if we really believe that God's the healer or not. I'm not sure if we really believe that or not. I don't know if we believe that God's the provider. Amen. I make you mad, but that's all right. I hope I do. I hope I make you mad enough to change. He said, beware of this religious attitude, this religious perspective. He said, also beware of the leaven of, the, of Herod. And, and this is a belief that puts humanism at the center of it all. That I'm the strength and I'm the one that can get myself out of the mess. And, and I'm the, this is where we get the political spirit from. You're going to be dependent on the government. Well, come on somebody. And making people uh, dependent. See, it puts humanism at the, at the center of this whole deal. It's okay to have a belief in God, but don't bring it into the equation. How many are we doing? That's happening all the time. Oh, it's okay, but you don't dare bring a, don't dare pray here in the middle of this football field. And you got one voice, somebody in the left-hand corner of the crowd, while everybody else is saying glory to God, and they start complaining, and all of a sudden, they go and start complaining, and the squeaky wheel gets to grease. Listen, church, it's time for us to start speaking up about what we believe. It's time to truly stand in the middle of this thing and say, God's your answer. We're not backing down. It's okay for you to have your belief in God, but you don't bring him into this equation. Political attitude is everywhere today. The political spirit is everywhere. You watch Fox News enough, it'll get in you. And it will destroy your perspective. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Let me help you. Listen. He ain't all right on there. And just because they have a political view, it doesn't make what they're saying doesn't make it's true. If our government would start learning to reach across the aisle and start lifting the people and putting the constituents above their own agendas, we would be a lot farther along today. But see, money and power is corrupting people and has corrupted people. And we got to have people that are strong in their faith and be able to go into these systems and say, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm reaching across. The I don't care if you have a D, an R, an I, a T, whatever it is, uh, uh, beside of your name, I don't care. Now, I'm not talking about people, I'm not talking about uh, letting down your standards and compromising. You can't even work together. You can't even, people can't even work together today because they, well, you, you're part of this party and you're not part of that party, so that makes you wrong. It's, a, it's, it's the leaven of Herod. 
And Jesus said it. He said, beware of these two perspectives. I got to adjust my attitude. I mean, it really gets me. I mean, you know, I'm not here to, I'm not, this is not a pulpit to try to uh, bring political uh, strife or division. That's not my heart. Just listen to me. But you know what? If the president wants to go on vacation, let him go and quit complaining about it. I mean, he goes and plays golf. Well, what do you want him to do? Maybe that's a good place for him to th- clear his mind. I'm not saying I agree with everything that, that the president does. I'm just saying we, try to, we bring stuff and try to cause and tear people down. This ought not be the way it is. You can get mad at me, whatever. I'm I'm not telling you my my political affiliation. I'm a conservative. I know that. I believe the Bible. I vote life. That's what I do. I believe in things. There are certain things that I do hold true. But come on. You know, the thing is, is is that you and I have to understand that everything that you see on the television is not God. And just because somebody has an R or a D beside of their name, get out of that. Probably the best thing for you to do is watch a little CNN and a little bit of Fox. Because you probably find a little truth in both of them. And a lot of false in others. All right, I'm off of this. Why am I talking about politics? All right. So Jesus comes and starts talking. He starts, I want, I want to teach you something about perspective, boys. And the boys start talking about bread. And I like a bunch of church folks start talking about food. Just all of a sudden, Jesus started talking about food. <laughs> Isn't that true? He said, well, I wasn't really talking about bread, but I'll go ahead and make it about bread then. I'll make it about food, boys. Just try to teach you a lesson. He was saying, listen, your point exactly is what I'm trying to get across to you. What you're trying to tell me about you being concerned about bread is really going to tell you about your perspective. <laughs> it's about your perspective. Jesus wasn't talking about, about bread, but he makes it about bread to reveal their attitude, the way they were seeing things. See, Jesus was trying to get the boys to realize this. Listen to me now. There's a realm of reality that coexists around you all the time. There's a realm that you cannot see. And if you got wrong leaven and a wrong perspective, it will keep you from seeing that reality. See, in order to access the supernatural and to access the perspective of God, Jesus said it. He said, you have eyes and you do not see. You have ears and you do not hear and you do not remember. Those three things will help you and I to access the realm of the supernatural. Jesus was trying to tell them, listen boys, you're concerned about about bread. Don't you understand there's a realm of reality that's around you where there is no lack? Do you understand there's a realm that is around you that's coexisting with you at all times where there is no want? Do you understand, boys, that where, where you're at, if you go and let perspectives change you, the next thing you know, you won't be able to see this reality. You won't be able to see me. You won't be able to tell when I'm working, when I'm working in the subtle ways God's working in subtle ways all the time and we accredit to our own power our own might or we go and accredit to some type of listen I don't care every good and every perfect gift comes from above it comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning every good gift comes from God every good gift comes from him If it comes to the hands of a physician, an operating room, or it comes by the supernatural, every good and every perfect gift comes from God. Your ability to work every day. It's not your own strength and power. See, that's the leaven of, that's, that's, see, that's, that's, that's that Herod spirit. That's that Herod attitude. It's my own might and my own power got me this. My daddy didn't love me. My mama didn't love me. They were this, that, and the other. And I went and done my own deal. And I, I made it myself. And I took my pay for myself to go through school. And, and I'm the one that brought all this. And God, God didn't help me. I helped myself. People think that all the time. People think it all the time. You can't see God working. It's the small, subtle things. When you wake up tomorrow morning and you see the sun breaking over top of the hill, shining on your house, it's a gift from God. 
God's working. God's working. It's my attitude. It's my attitude. How's your attitude today? Do you need an attitude adjustment? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Praise God. You guys all right? I think I'll preach about 2 today. So we'll break about noon and have lunch and we'll come back. I just want you to see something. I just want you to see something today. That there's another, you have to adjust your attitude to see God. We live in a world that's full of skepticism. You can take the testimony right here about drinking the water and you say, well, that's all coincidence. That's not coincidence. That's God moving. And the minute, listen, this is, this is good right here. It just came to me. The reason we never see harvest a lot of times is because we're not thankful for the small things. We, we don't, we're not thankful for the small things. I know we not, maybe not saw the manifestation or the completeness of it, but the Bible says first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. There's a process. And maybe your crop is not coming up because you're not thankful because you have the wrong attitude. Amen. All right, I'll get off of that. Let's go. That's for, that's for, that was somebody for the, that was on, the, on the other end of that camera. Somebody in California was listening to that minute. 2 Corinthians 4.13, but since we have the same what? Spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13, we have the same what? Or attitude of faith. We have the same, the word spirit here means attitude. We have the same attitude of faith. Do you have an attitude of faith? Are you settled in your thinking concerning faith? Are you, are you concerned, are you, are you, is your attitude, are you so, so sold out on the word of God and what God says for your life? He said, you've got to have, we have the same spirit of faith, the same attitude of faith, according to what is what? Written. My attitude is anchored into the word. According to what, was, what is written. He said, my spirit, I have a spirit of faith, you have a spirit of faith, we have an attitude of faith, we have a settled way of thinking, and that thinking is the word. According to that which is written. So this is my, my, my lens. This is my glasses. Man, when you're struggling in a hard time, you got to go back to the God glasses. you got to see it. According to that which was written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. He's quoting Psalm 116, which was a psalm of David. You have the same giant killer faith in you. He was talking here in Psalm 116. He was running. He was talking, recollecting about his story, about he ran from Saul when he was running from Saul and when he was in that period between being anointed king and becoming king. It's a hard time for David if you read about it. But he said, I had a spirit of faith. I had an attitude of faith. I had a perspective of faith. So when sickness comes knocking on your door, get an attitude. When things start going on with your kids, get an attitude. Get an attitude of faith. According to that which was written, look what he says here in verse 17. For our light affliction. Let me tell you something. Anything the apostle Paul did had happened to him was not light. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's pretty powerful. Stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, snake bitten. No, we wouldn't even get there. We just had just somebody talk bad about us and we're ready to quit. And he called those afflictions what? Stoned, left for dead, uh, snake bitten. Uh, three days and three nights in the deep. He was floating around in the ocean. Sleepless, hungry. I mean, you can read it. It's powerful. He calls these things light. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are what? Not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary or subject to change. 
Your situations are subject to change. Quit looking at them as permanent and start speaking to them and say, you're subject to change and you are changing. Come on, somebody. It's an attitude of faith. Believing and speaking the word. That's an attitude of faith. Your confession is powerful. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. That's not some type of, 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 of religious babble of trying to get you to do some or manipulation. This is the word of God and there's power in the word of God when you speak the word. But we speak more about our problems than we do the word. We complain more than we do speak about the word. And we wonder why we're still in the situations and our attitude is bad. Because that becomes a stronghold. That becomes the way you think. You ever get around negative folks? They're everywhere. They can never see any good in anything. Ever. You need an attitude adjustment. I seen that on a paddle one time. <laughs> Who was that? Somebody tell me, is that yours? Was that your paddle? You have a paddle? Okay, was that on your paddle? An attitude adjustment? Attitude adjuster? Somebody, somebody told me that one time. <laughs> Sorry, Jamie, I wasn't trying to say it. But somebody added on a paddle one time for their kids. Attitude adjuster. We need an attitude adjustment. We need to get back to the word. The apostle Paul said, listen, according to that which was written, I have the attitude of faith according to that which was written. When you're going through a problem, find the, find the scripture for it and see it through the word. For our light affliction, praise God. In verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. They're not subject to change. So listen what he said. Notice he said there's things that you cannot see. Just because you can't see it. Doesn't mean it's not there. This is important. If you're going to walk by faith. You've got to believe there's a realm that you cannot see. And it takes my attitude to be adjusted. That's what Jesus was trying to get across to the boys. He said, don't let these types of attitudes affect your viewpoint. There is a realm that's coexisting with you at all times. There's a realm that you cannot see. That there's things, real things that are in it. Can you see electricity? It's a thing that exists so you can't see it. But no, listen, if I said to you today, I need some electricity, what would you say? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a power outlet right there. There's, a, there's an outlet right there, Pastor Paul. Go stick, your, go stick your plug in there. Right? There's no question whether there's any power to this thing. I mean, you go, if you're working in your house and you're doing construction, well, you go and turn off the power. You can't even see it. But you believe it's so. And you'll make adjustments. Oh, come on, somebody. He'll, you'll make adjustments with everything. Go to the power box. You'll go through. You'll have these sniffers, right, that goes around and, and sniffs out, make sure there's no electric on it, right? You'll do all of these things just to make sure. Why can't we do that with our faith? Adjusting our whole life around the things we can't see. He said, the things which you don't see or you see are temporary, subject to change. But the things you don't see are eternal. You're going to have problems and situations in this world. Sorry. Faith never puts you in a bubble. Ever. And the minute you think there's some things you've got to go through. I don't care how much. I believe, so Pastor Paul, don't you believe your confession can, can cause and, and, and divert things? Absolutely. I, I believe that. I believe you confess the word. I believe, man, you can, you can, you can divert disaster and things will happen. You'll get moved out of the way. But there are just some things I got to go through. I said what? Through. I didn't say stuck. I said what? Through. And see, it's faith that gets me through it. And see, on the other side of this thing, you say, man, you even look back and say, you know what? I'm glad I went through it. Well, it wasn't God, but you had faith to be able to overcome. 
There's a lot of people that's stuck in the valley of decision, that's stuck in the valley of darkness, stuck in the valley of death. The Bible says, yea, though I walk what? Through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I walk through the valley and I don't get stuck in it. Come on, faith gives me the ability to go through the situations and the circumstances and bring you back out on the other side. Amen? Hallelujah. Yeah, give the Lord a good hank of a praise. Come on, give me. I don't want no welfare claps, all right? I don't, I don't need no golf clap. He said, there's things that you can't see. There's a realm and reality that's around you. But I have to have an attitude adjustment to be able to see it. So faith helps me to overcome. Go with me to 1 John real quick. Hurry, hurry. 1 John. Faith operates from a superior reality. Faith operates from a superior reality. It's not unreasonable, it's reasonable. Hallelujah. Are you guys with me? Turn on the air or something. Are both those airs on? Both of them on, Jack? Put it down to 55 or something. <laughs> it won't ever get there, but at least it'd be. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, let me say this to you. Jesus said in John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. Now, listen, the word in the tense, this is so good, listen now. It's, it's the word nikeo, okay, nikeo is the Greek. We get the word Nike, the, you know, the Nike shoes. It means victory. The word Nike on somebody's shoes means victory. It's a Greek word. And Jesus said, I've, I'm victorious. But listen what the tense, this is the tense that, that brings it out. And, 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 and it's, it's victory. But the tense here reflects not just one time victory, but a continual and abiding victory. It means this. Jesus said, he said, he said you know, in this world you're going to have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'm still overcoming the world and will always be overcoming the world. Okay? You're an overcomer. Right? Mandisa. Come on, Mandisa. Help me. Turn that on. I thought it was going to come on. I'm an overcomer. Right? And I am. Because I'm in Christ. But just because you're a believer don't mean that these things are going to fall on you like ripe cherries. Off of a tree. Hallelujah. He said, I've overcome the world. I've overcome the systems of the world. I've overcome the place the devil influences. And look what he says here in 1 John 5. Verse 4 and 5. For whatever, I don't like that translation. That's not a good translation. You're not a whatever. I think the King James says whatever, whatever too, right? I read out of the New King James. Oh, the King James got that one right. Their translations. Okay, in verse 4, for whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our what? What's going to help you to overcome? Understand there's a superior reality. An attitude that understands there's things that I cannot see. The world was created by things that you can't see. He, uh, Hebrews 11 says that. It says the worlds were created by things that you cannot see. The things that you see, were, were you, what, the things that you see are not made of things which do appear. What's he saying? He said there's a realm. It all started in the supernatural and then manifested in the natural. It's the same thing with you and I. Everything starts in the supernatural and manifests in the natural. But we can't get out of the natural enough to go tap into the supernatural. Our attitude's wrong. We need an adjustment. My faith is what helps me to overcome the world. Well, I don't have... Yes, you do have faith. 
The Bible says God has dealt to you the measure of faith. You have the same faith of Jesus. On the, the scripture says that in Galatians chapter 2. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Well, where's that faith at? It's in you. You got supernatural faith. But you will never access what you got. Listen to me now. As a believer, the eyes were put in your heart when you got saved. John 3, 3. Unless a man be born again, he cannot what? See the kingdom of God. When I got born again, there was eyes placed on my heart, in my heart. So now I can see a realm that I couldn't see before. If you're not born again in here today, forget walking in faith. You'll believe in the existence of God, but never interact with Him. Oh, come on, somebody. Why wouldn't you want to be saved in here this morning? Why wouldn't you want to be saved? Why would you not? Who in the world wants to go to hell anyway? That's crazy. This is the best life, man. I didn't say it was the easy life. I said it's the best way to live. It's the best way to live. So listen. When you got born again, you, you, you got eyes placed in your heart. Now, this is the deal. Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1. That the eyes, he said, he said, the eyes of my understanding or the eyes of my heart would be enlightened. See, Jesus comes to give you revelation from the word and it gives you insight and gives you light. The entrance of your word gives light. Right? The word is a lamp unto my feet, light to my path. Light, light, light. Why? Because your eyes can see things that your head can't. And you got to make sure of something. Listen to me now. If you're going by these, the, the, by these right here, these peepers right here, and what's going on right here, you're not going to walk in the supernatural. Because, listen, when you and I start believing God, everything, it's going to be contrary to everything that you see. But you have eyes in your heart that can see things that these eyes cannot see. Oh, come on, somebody. That's why God gave us his word. He wrote it down. That way we could get it before our eyes. That way we could see the finish line. Come on, somebody. It's always easier to, when you see the finish line. It just seems like something starts to, it doesn't matter, all the pain and all the hurt and all that you've been going concentrated on as you've been running. All of a sudden, you start seeing the finish line. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter about the pain. You're pushing towards the end. The word gives you the answer. It shows you where you're going, not where you're at. Quit looking where you're at and start looking where you're going by getting in the word. Word and letting the word speak to you about your life and about where it's going. Hallelujah. I'm making sense here to you. Faith. Jesus said it. He said, You have eyes, but you do not see. You have ears, and you do not hear. He was saying, Boys, I've given you the capabilities to look into a realm, and you're not using it. You're being affected by the attitude of the world. Come on, somebody. I'm making sense to you. Eyes, but you do not see. Ears, but you do not hear. My faith needs a reference point, church. If your faith doesn't have a reference point, it has nothing to grab a hold of. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I have to have a reference point, an anchor for my faith in, for, in order for it to work. And it's going to be something that you see with the eyes of your heart, not the eyes of your head. If you see it, you don't need faith for it. If you see it, you don't need faith for it. So what do you believe in God for? Come on. He's creating worlds right now. I mean, he's a creator. That's what he does. God creates. So he'll get busy doing something else. But I'm not going to let God get busy doing creating something else. Creating another planet or whatever. I'm going to let him get busy creating for me. He's a creator. That's what he does. 
Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. My perspective will determine my reward. I'm going to say it again. My perspective and my attitude will return, determine my reward. I got to believe that he is. He is what? He's healer. He's deliverer. He's the fixer of relationships. He's peace. He's joy. He's love. I got to believe that God is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I got to believe that, Je that God is Jehovah Sidkenu, my righteousness. I got to believe that God is Jehovah Shalom, my peace. I got to believe that he is Jehovah Mekadesh, the God that sanctifies me and sets me apart. I got to believe that he's Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I got to believe that he's Jehovah Rohi. The shepherd of my soul. And I don't like or want anything. i got to believe that he is. And when I believe that he is. He's a rewarder of that faith. For what I'm believing for. Hallelujah. He's a rewarder of my life. He wants to reward me. That's God. He's a creator. Start putting him to, to work church. Put him to work with your faith. And quit looking with your eyes and start looking from a different perspective. Adjust your attitude. And get settled on what God's word says. And don't give up on it. Tomorrow morning you wake up and you speak the word. If it doesn't change, 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 you speak the word. If it does, it's changing, I promise. You just don't see it right now. There's something moving underneath the foundation. There's a little shaking that starts to happen underneath when you start speaking the word. I don't know, it may not be crumbling right now, but there's something giving away. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you stand up one morning and you start speaking and a great earthquake starts to come and because of all that shaking underneath that thing topples and goes down yeah. hallelujah yeah. Woo, I'm having a good time it's good stuff it's fun alright I gotta move we gotta close this thing do I have to so Jesus said these words he said you have eyes but you don't see you have ears and you don't hear and you don't remember you don't remember Listen to me. Testimony is very important to adjusting your attitude. See, Jesus said, you're not, you don't understand. There's a realm around you that's coexisting. You don't have eyes. You can't see it. You don't have ears. Come on, boys. But you should be hearing something different. You should be seeing something. But don't you really remember? They just fed, he just fed 7,000 people. And the testimony of that didn't affect him. What are you saying? I got to keep the testimony alive. See, it's very important. It stirs people's faith to believe. Testimony produces a reference point. See, testimony produced me to write theology. What are you saying? I'm saying we're in a world that's full of skepticism. We're in a world that's full of people that says, Well, I don't believe God, and I'm not seeing it out of this and that. You're, I, don't, I don't believe God still heals today. You've got religious people. I see, that's that spirit of, see, that's that spirit of the Pharisees, right? That's on people. That puts God in the center of everything, but he is not involved. And that ceased with the apostles. And that went away. And this passed away. And that passed away. And we've relegated our Bible to about that thing right there. But you cannot. Come on. You can't refute. And you can't stand and speak against somebody. That has a testimony. <laughs> you can't. You can't. See, I'm already too far in this thing. You can't talk me out of it. Too far. It's all too much. I want to see a lot more. Promise you. And we're going to see a lot more. But listen, I, I, I just saw too much. That's what old Dan, old Dan Moeller says. I, you, you've showed up way too late. You've showed up way too late. I already saw. I've saw too much. Because why? The testimony keeps me fueled. Now, I'm going to tell you this. We've got to keep the testimony alive in this church. Because there's a generation of kids that need to see testimony. Come on somebody. What's God done for you? You need to speak about it. You need to speak about it. I don't care if you tell the story. I don't care if God's done one thing for you. You just keep telling the testimony. 
because somebody needs to hear the testimony. Because when somebody hears the testimony, the throne, the, the lies of the enemy it starts to be dethroned. Come on, somebody. you got somebody with a barren womb that comes in, and all of a sudden, Mary Ann stands up and starts talking about drinking the water. Listen, if I was barren in this place, I could drink the water. I would. I'd go drink it. We had somebody that traveled all the way here. Has that happened yet? Huh. I said, yet. But they came all the way here. Yeah. All right, come on. Let's, yeah, it's good. Hold on a second. Right here, uh, last Sunday, prayed. Sunday evening, 5.30, bottle was taken. That baby started sucking. Friday evening, he's home. Amen. He's doing good. Amen. Prayer answered. Yes, we prayed for him right there. The mom and dad was right here, the burden down. Because her baby was in the NICU and, and wasn't eating. And we, we prayed and believed God. And guess what? She, that evening, come on, somebody starts taking the bottle. You can say what you want. You can say what you want. Come on. Testimony. Jesus said, don't you remember? Isn't it amazing when we get in a problem that we forget everything that we've learned? Isn't that amazing the way we do that? We get in the middle of an issue and we forget it all. Every word, I've been here, church. Come on, I've been right here and forgot it. Jesus said, you make sure that you keep remembering me feeding 5,000 people. You keep remembering me feeding 7,000 people. You keep remembering. Come on, when the two right here couldn't even have a baby. And Pastor Jim laid hands on them and now they have two babies. Come on, and you got somebody that has a barren womb and they drink some water. Come on, it's a prophetic act. It starts to happen. And all of a sudden they show up, going to take her, going to take all of her, her female organs out in two weeks. God shows up, puts a baby in her womb. The testimony is there. Stirs people's faith to believe in an unseen realm. The lies of the enemy. You come in here, maybe you're believing things that are just not true. It's never going to change. It's never going to happen. You're never going to get out of this mess. And all of a sudden, somebody stands up and gives a testimony. And grace is imparted into you. The Bible says the spirit of prophecy or the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When we give a prophecy, it, it infuses people with the character of God. The nature of God. It begin to see, man, God's like that. He loves, he loves that person. He loves me. The testimony of Jesus is what it says. Revelation 9, 19, 13, I think. Revelation, or the, uh, the, the revelation, or how is it? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is something that takes and pushes somebody into their destiny. And all of a sudden, you give, somebody stands up and hears a word. And their faith is stirred. And all of a sudden, this dead God that seems to be disconnected becomes real. Because why? It's showing you that, that, that he's a God that's personally interacting. You can't see him with your eyes, but you can see him with your heart. You can't hear him with your ears, but you can hear him with the ears of your heart. Amen. You know, there's eyes in your heart and there's an ear in your heart. H-E-A-R-T. In your heart is an ear. You start hearing testimony of how God delivered you, brought you out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. How he delivered you from, a, from the house of bondage and from the things in your life, delivered you from drugs or delivered you from alcohol, set you free because you were a whore in your past. I don't care what it was. When Jesus touches your life, he redeems it. He redeems it. And nothing is ever wasted. Ever. Do you not see? Do you not hear? Can you not remember? The word testimony in the Hebrew means to do it again. It's fitting. The word testimony in the Hebrew means to do again. So when somebody hears the testimony... What's it saying to them? God can do it again. It's a reference point. It's a reference point. It's something I can anchor my life into. 
when someone comes to you and says, well, I don't believe God's like that. Oh, it's okay. Here's a testimony. Oh, that's all right. I love you, but here's a testimony. You can't talk me out of this. You can't talk me out of it. And nothing will ever convince you, Marion, ever. I can go around the room and talk about testimonies, but never convince you. There wasn't anything in that water. It was a prophetic act. And she was obedient to do something prophetically. See, some, some, sometimes God will make you, or he'll make you do things. He'll, I don't say make you. He'll ask you. God never makes us do anything. He'll ask you to do something in the natural that has a reflection that something's going to happen in the supernatural. See, it may be you sitting right here, and all of a sudden you want to go and dance. And all of a sudden you get out here and you start, see, all of a sudden what it is, lots of God said, come and dance for me. Come and dance out here. Step out and dance. And here's the enemy. Oh, you're going to be made a fool. People are going to look at you. But when you go and you do the prophetic act, something is released into your life at that moment. That's why it's important that you obey God. Even when it looks stupid. I heard a testimony. Uh, it was a guy who was, uh, was in a conference. And uh, this lady was, it was a prophetic conference. And they were doing some things and activating people into prophecy and stuff. And uh, this guy in the back of the room I mean, they were like giving this word, these words to this person and this lady, you know, and she's being ministered to. And all of a sudden, this guy in the back of the room shouted out, You got a yellow shirt! You got a yellow shirt on! She had a yellow shirt on. That wasn't hard. How ridiculous. She has a yellow shirt on. Somebody in a prophetic conference, in a prophetic conference, stands up and says, You have a yellow shirt on. The lady breaks down and starts crying uncontrollably. Because she said, Lord, if you need, if, 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 I want you to do this for me, this, 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 and help my son or whatever it was. And if you're going to do this for me, God, I'm asking you to have somebody tell me I have a yellow shirt on. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I should pull that one up. Stand on your head. I see if I can tell that story. I hope I can tell it. There was this woman. She was uh, trying to hear the voice of God. She was learning how to hear the voice of God. And she said, the Lord just said, I want you to go driving. So he, she went driving. And she said, you know, she was trying to be led by the Lord, you know, and turn left, turn right. So the Lord led her to this convenience store. And I'm probably not telling it exactly, but I'll get the gist of the story out. And she pulled up to the convenience store. And he said, I want you to go there and stand on your head in front of the cashier. Now, we probably already checked out right there. <laughs> checked out. Let's just be honest. Let's just, the rubber hits the road. Let's just be honest here today. Come on, this is, we could just be honest. We checked out. But the deal was, she walked in there, and here she is. She's walking around, you know, inside the convenience store. The story was saying that she was walking around wanting everybody to leave. So finally, there was a pole that was right there kind of in front of the cashier. She goes and climbs the pole and gets on her head and stands on her, and up, up against this pole. And the guy behind the cashier begins to be broken. The, the cashier counter begins to be broken. He said, ma'am, however long it was, it might have been an hour or five or ten minutes, whatever it was. He said, I just told God, if you're re real, have somebody come here and stand on her head in front of me. God will ask you to do things that seem crazy. But all of a sudden, because of that obedience, it releases power to change. Come on, church. Having eyes, do you see? Having ears, do you hear? And can you remember?